Hello, in this video we are talking about thermal energy. We're going to start talking about temperature, heat, that kind of thing. Um, this is really just an intro to topic B1, so here we go. Our big idea for this whole beginning of the unit, really, um, is thinking in terms of macroscopic and microscopic properties. So we're going to be picturing the very small scale behavior of molecules and atoms and how what they're doing uh, affects what we see in our macroscopic big picture kind of everyday life. Um, you can't see all the little H2Os doing their H2O thing in your glass of water, but their combined effect of the billions of billions of billions of H2Os in your glass of water will affect like the temperature. It might affect like the fact that it's water and not ice. So macroscopic properties will cover things like temperature and phase, things that we kind of recognize on a bigger scale, and microscopic properties is when we're thinking about the very small scale, the molecules or atoms that make up a substance and typically their energy. So temperature is something we talk about a lot. You have a good sense of the word temperature from everyday life. It is a specific thing when we talk about it in a very sciencey, physics-y way. So here's what we're gonna say about temperature. Temperature is a measure of the average random kinetic energy of the particles of a substance. So temperature has to do with, but isn't equal to, but it has to do with kinetic energy. It has to do with how the particles of a substance are moving, often vibrating. And the idea here is that this is a macroscopic property. Because it's an average, the talk about the temperature of a single particle is meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. Temperature is a way of measuring the kind of overall motion of all of the particles of a substance. Something really, really cold has particles moving, vibrating slowly, something really, really hot, the particles are moving or vibrating quickly with more energy. It is a random thing, so we talk about a mean, an average. Not every single particle is doing the same thing, but on average at a low temperature, the particles would be moving more slowly than at a high temperature. So here's an equation from your data booklet about that their relationship this shows the relationship between that average kinetic energy and temperature. The E with the bar over it here, that's uh, the bar is like our symbol, math symbol for a mean. Like you might see X with the bar on top in math class, that means the average of your X values. So it's the average, the mean kinetic energy of the molecules of a thing equals three halves times this Boltzmann constant from the front of your data booklet. Uh, be careful because there's lots of Ks. This is K sub B. And T is temperature. We will use the temperature in Kelvin. That's important for this equation. Um, and so make sure you are okay with how to convert between temperature in Kelvin and in degrees Celsius. This helpful thing in the front of your data booklet will help you with that. And one big thing to think about here is what is absolute zero? Well, this equation kind of tells us what's happening at absolute zero. The temperature zero Kelvin is sort of defined like this. If something is at zero Kelvin, that means the particles are not moving or shouldn't be moving uh, according to this because the average kinetic energy would be zero at zero temperature. And that's one kind of way to think about why absolute zero is an absolute thing. You can't have less than none kinetic energy, right? Negative kinetic energy, remember, not a thing. All right, so you're at it. that's the idea of temperature. Let's talk about some other stuff that you should be pretty comfortable with at this point in your science career, but the states of matter, solids, liquids, gases, uh, is what we're really concerned with here. So some ideas about solids and liquids and gases when we're picturing the particles. So here's some H2O in multiple phases. Um, so here in the ice cube, we can picture H2O's all locked in like a lattice, you know, in sort of fixed positions, and now it's 3D, we have to imagine. But they're all kind of stuck in place, but they can vibrate back and forth. They're all just kind of jiggling in place there. Yeah, 
And as the ice heats up, they'll vibrate more and more and faster and faster and faster, but they can't really move in an overall sense. Whereas in water, like liquid water, there is a little more tumbling and rolling around. Um, the H2Os are loosely connected to each other. They're grabbing onto each other a little bit, but not nearly as much as in a solid. So there's still some vibration that happens, but there's also some, you could say, translational movement, movement in a straight line, as all these particles are like rolling around on top of each other. And we know hopefully stuff like they fit the shape of the container and so on. And we also have gases, let's say bubbles in your water. Um, those gases are picture H2Os as like ping pong balls just flying around willy-nilly. They're just bouncing all over the place. They don't care about each other at all. They, uh, there's essentially no attraction between the molecules. They're not held together in any way, so they're just totally moving in straight lines, bouncing around all over the place. No vibration uh, really in this state. One thing to think about in terms of what's happening here is that sort of how they're connected. So in chemistry, you might talk about intermolecular forces or interatomic if it's just single atoms. And the idea is there's a strong intermolecular forces holding the H2Os in an ice cube together. They're bound up in each other pretty tightly. Those forces are weaker in a liquid and almost non-existent in a gas. And this is a little loose, especially for like water, but in general, you can think about this stuff in terms of potential energy. When the molecules are far apart, like in gas form, we can say they have a lot of potential energy um, as opposed to when they're held tightly together. That potential energy, when you turn into, say, a solid, is you can think of it as bound up in the binding energy holding these different molecules together. Okay, so those two things together are called internal energy. You add up these ideas of intramolecular potential energy and random kinetic energy. You really, really, like one very big idea that a lot of this whole unit comes down to, you want to associate phase, like solid liquid gas, so associate phase with potential energy and associate temperature with kinetic energy. Right, that's kind of the macroscopic, microscopic link. So yeah, potential energy has to do with phase. This is one way to think of it that's a little sloppy, but this is a pretty good way to think of it. Um, as you go from like a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas, you're sort of breaking these bonds that hold the molecules together, and the energy there um, turns into potential energy. So the energy like holding all the H2Os tightly together in an ice cube gets turned into potential energy as you change phase and turn it from, say, ice to liquid water. And random kinetic energy is this temperature idea. They vibrate faster. That's a higher temperature. So a good example is like a bucket of water on the floor. We would say typically it has no energy, like it has no mechanical energy, but it does have internal energy because if we picture the H2O is inside of the you know, water, they definitely have kinetic energy and potential energy. That's the idea of internal energy. It's different than our usual mechanical energy where you got a, you know, bowling ball flying through the air or something. We're thinking now in terms of the very small world, the molecules inside of a glass of water and what they're doing. And that'll help us when we start talking about how things can transfer this type of energy between them through heat. So here you go. That's what heat is. Heat. We're going to use Q for heat. Why not? Heat means thermal energy. It is an amount of energy. So you're going to measure it in joules. And it is this transfer um, between objects that typically uh, is going to be because of a temperature difference. Do be careful. Heat and temperature are not the same thing. Temperature is not a thing you measure in joules. Heat is a thing you measure in joules. And heat is not even really the same thing as internal energy. In the same way as work and energy aren't exactly the same thing, work is like a change in energy. Heat is very much a similar idea. Heat is like how much energy flows from one thing to another. And one way to picture this uh, is that heat will flow from warm to cool. So if you have a 
say hot object and cool object in contact, heat will flow from the hot object to the cool object. And heat will flow until those two things reach the same temperature. We call that thermal equilibrium. Okay, so heat is an amount of energy moving from one thing to another. How does that work? Well, great news. We have like a whole unit on how that works and all the fun details and math of some of these different options. Right now, we're just going to go over the three ways that you can do that, the three ways that you can transfer heat between objects. First is conduction. Conduction is pretty straightforward. This is transfer by contact. This is stuff bumping into each other. It's really just collisions. It's like if you really wanted, you could do conservation of momentum like a billion, billion, billion times. Uh, but we can simplify things. I don't think we need to do a billion, billion, billion calculations. But here's the picture to have. Um, you know, hot flame heating up some air. These are air molecules nearby. The ones close to the flame start to vibrate a lot because of kinetic energy and they bump into their neighbors and they transfer that vibration down and suddenly all of the air is jiggling and wiggling around as it heats up. So just transfer by contact, it's just collisions. Convection is another way you can transfer heat and this has to do with fluids, how fluids work. Fluids being uh, liquids and gases. Um, you probably know that like hot air rises, that's how a fluid tends to behave, is a warmer fluid will kind of spread out a bit and become less dense. And so when you have a fluid that's being heated uh, in some way, picture putting a, a pot of water on the stove, you heat up the bottom of the pot probably by conduction, direct contact, and even the water on the bottom you could say is conduction. But then what you're going to have is hot water at the bottom. That hot water is going to rise because it's got a lower density than the cool water, which will fall down. And you get this like mixing that happens. Yeah, so the hot stuff rises up and cools down a bit, then falls back down, then rises up and falls down. So you get a nice even distribution of heat. Convection ovens are kind of doing this a bit. If you've heard of convection ovens, they're just forcing the air to move around so you can spread out that heat more evenly. And while we're on the subject of density, a little unrelated, but this is in the data booklet. You hopefully know this, but this is what density is. Density, here's, they give you the equation for density. It's mass over volume. We measure density in kilograms per cubic meter. That's the Greek letter rho, R-H-O for density, not a P. And M and V for mass and volume. All right, and there's one more way, one more very fun way that heat can be transferred. A very important way that we have so much physics behind and we'll dig into. A thermal radiation. So here's sort of the argument here. Um, okay, if something has a temperature above absolute zero, like, you know, everything, it is made of stuff that's vibrating. Yeah, there's like molecules vibrating back and forth because temperature. Molecules are what? Little, you know, blobs of stuff. Blobs of, oh, protons and electrons and neutrons, which are charged particles. So vibration means things are moving back and forth, changing velocity, changing direction, meaning they're accelerating, meaning we have charges, electric charges that are accelerating. And of course you remember that this is the way that you make light. You make light when a, a charge is accelerated. An accelerating charge will produce electromagnetic radiation, aka light. And so... Everything that's got some temperature, which is everything, must be giving off a little bit of light. And it's true. Um, so we call that thermal radiation. Energy that's uh, sent away from an object in the form of light, EM, waves. Because of thermal motion, this random vibrational motion of the particles which have charged things in them. Uh, yeah, so all things at the small scale, you know, look at your hand. If you could zoom way, 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 way in and see some individual molecules, they might look like this, all jiggling and bouncing around. So you got, you know, like a little electron here or something going boing, 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 back and forth, back and forth. Every time it changes its velocity, it spits out a little bit of light. So lots of fun to come in terms of like uh, how much temperature affects the amount of energy and that kind of thing. But in general, if something's warm and its molecules are vibrating, it will give off light. 
that light transfers energy, which uh, is a amount of heat. So the outdoor heat lamps, for example, like this, that's what they're doing. They got some metal stuff up here that's super hot and you don't have to like touch it to warm up, right? You could be sitting way over here. And this thing is has little molecules that are vibrating like a lot and they spit out some light, probably infrared light that we feel on our skin as nice warm heat. And some thermal energy is transferred to us that way. And the sun is the most important, probably one of these things that's transferring heat. Uh, if it weren't for the sun, we wouldn't be here. All of the energy, nearly, nearly all of the energy we use, have ever used on the planet, that like anything on the planet has used, comes from the sun. And the only way that energy gets to us is through this thermal radiation. It can't conduct heat through the vacuum of space. There's nothing there to bump against. And it can't convect because there's nothing there to flow through. Yeah, so it has to be this thermal radiation. So light from the sun is giving us all of our energy here on planet Earth. So thermal radiation is a pretty good thing. And we will get into the math of this and some other stuff quite soon. Um, but yeah, there you go. That's your intro to thermal radiation. See you next time.